We love you, Lord. Would you open up our ears to hear your word? Today is a hard truth. And God, would, I need your Holy Spirit to not only work this in my life, but in your people. So Lord, help us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So we're towards the end of our series on faith, Hebrews 11, and part of chapter 12. Um, I'm obviously speaking in front of you today, and then next week, we got an amazing treat. Our sister Janet is going to be speaking, yeah, uh, because there are incredible women of faith in the Bible, and, and, and it's not just specific to women. You know, we men need to learn from these women of faith, and so Janet's going to pick up a few mentions of women in this hall of faith that we read in Hebrews 11 and preach an amazing word. I've got a preview of it. It's an amazing word, so don't miss out next week. And then we'll wrap up the following week. Uh, but turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter, we're going to start at chapter 11. And today I'm going to teach on something fairly difficult to teach in any setting, but especially in this city where uh, you can step outside and get sun almost every day of the year. There's oceans, there's mountains, beautiful people, beautiful places. And I'm going to talk about suffering <laughs> on Valentine's Day. And maybe for some of you that's, that's appropriate. <laughs> Um, I don't mean that as an insult. I mean, it's just, it can be, you know, anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. All right, let's move on. Get out of those waters. Um, last week, I talked about the race of faith. And today, I want to ask the question, what do you do when your race takes you into a difficult and painful place? And maybe as we read the hall of faith, you're thinking, wow, this is just glory to glory. I mean, Abraham did amazing things, and then Moses did amazing things, and David did amazing things, and they, they, they shut the mouth of lions, and they conquered armies, they knocked down walls, all this for Jesus. Yeah, where's my leg going to take me to? What victory will I win? What demons will I slay and cast out? And, and then you get to chapter 11, verse 35, and um, it takes an uh, interesting turn. Look at verse 35. I'm going to read second half of it, there were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better res resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes and in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had been planned, God had planned something better for us, that only together with us would they be made perfect. That's a disturbing turn. I don't like the fact that some of my heroes were sawed in two. I don't like that. In fact, part of me wants to say, well, that's their race. That's like the ancient race. It was rougher back then. But then you look at Hebrews chapter 12, where we are being recruited to run our leg of the race. Listen to what it says, and I, I preached on this last week, but I just want to read this. Verse 1, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, these are the people that we just read about in chapter 11, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance. There's your first clue. This race is not easy. It takes perseverance. The race marked out for us. And notice where our eyes are being called to be fixed. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Awesome. He walked on water, healed the sick, resurrected. This guy's cool. The pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Where does the author have us fix our eyes? On Jesus. On the glorified, resurrected Jesus? In part, but the spotlight here is on his cross. On the suffering he endured. The author says, take heart from that. Um, okay, so if Jesus is the model of our race, he's our inspiration, that means that race inherently involves a cross. And Jesus himself said uh, in Luke chapter 9, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life 
uh, loses their life for me will save it. So when it says fix your eyes on Jesus, we're fixing our eyes on Jesus who went to the cross and who also said to each of us, take up your cross, which doesn't mean wear a cross necklace. And I have nothing against that, but that's not what it means. And it doesn't mean like you suffer inconveniences and say, oh, I'm taking up my cross. If I were to put that in today's language, it means take up your gas chamber, take up your electric chair, because the cross was an instrument of death. So when Jesus invites you to follow him, what he's saying is, when you follow me, you cross over the threshold of your own life, and you basically give your life up. You give your right to comfort, your right to ease, your right to luxury, your right to anything of your flesh, and when you follow me, you're pursuing me to a cross. Wherever your faith leads, you're going to follow me, and oftentimes it's going to go into difficult places because you are living your faith in a broken world. Jesus, who is the Son of God, was a brilliant light a tender heart, holy and innocent among jagged, sinful people. And no matter where he navigated, he got cut, he got wounded, ultimately ending up on a cross, betrayed by his friends, abandoned. And so when Jesus calls us to follow, it's that same calling, to have his heart in this broken world. And how can we also, if we're serious about following him, not be wounded, not be cut, not be put to death, so to speak, if our model, our hero, our inspiration did the very same thing. And so the author here is addressing a very specific situation in the church, but so relevant to today. The audience he was addressing was going through suffering, hardship, because uh, the Roman Empire started to turn the heat up on these Christians. They saw them as this bizarre cult, just Jesus' cult. And so this wasn't outright just feeding them to the lions yet. That would come a a few decades later. But this is where, like, their businesses are being shut down. People are being dragged to prison. The culture is shunning them. It's right before genocide. Think of, like, how the Jews were treated in Germany right before the Holocaust, where they weren't being put in trains yet, but their businesses were being targeted, vandalized. People were feeling scared because it was dangerous to be a Jew. Well, back then, it was dangerous to be a Christian. And there was this pressure just to be like, well, why not just go back to Judaism? Because at least that's protected. And so here is the author trying to motivate them to run their race. And the way he does it, it's, it's so tender, he basically says, what are you complaining about? Look at verse 4. In your struggle against sin, this is chapter 12, verse 4, You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. He's basically saying, why are you guys whining? Are you surprised? Did you forget who you're chasing after? Who your example is? And this is not the author being cruel. I think he's being a little hyperbolic. I think he's trying to kind of be in their face about this to remind them that if you're expecting your race to be any different, then we're not running the right race. This race will take us through suffering. The question is not, why me? And how do I get out of this as quickly as possible? It is, how do I meet this necessary pain with faith? With faith. And then the author continues. Let's read together. Have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son. It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as a discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, then everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees, Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled. 
but rather healed. Is it okay if I preach God's word today? Yeah? Is it okay if I preach what's in this text? Because it's not easy. And if you hear something you agree with, you can say something back. If you hear something you don't agree with, you can talk back to me anyway. I like dialogue, but this is a hard word, so just keep praying for me as I preach it and pray for yourself to receive it. But here's the first thing I get. As, as faith meets suffering, three convictions spill out of this text for me. Three convictions I want you to hold on to because if you notice the boards, this one far outweighs this one. And in this life, it'll always be this way. This life is full of pain. Now the question is, why? Why does God allow this? And here's the first thing. Nothing will touch me that is not coming from love. Do you agree with that? Well, if you don't, or if that's a question for you, let me try to show you from the text. When we suffer, we often default to two fairly unbiblical positions. One is that God is asleep at the wheel and he just doesn't care. Or second, even worse, is that God is vindictive and he's getting me back for something. And both are sub-God. Like, they're not God. God is never a sleepy and God is never vindictive. He's not cruel. And so the author gives us a different way to view this. He says that the suffering, the, the hardship, the trials you're going through is actually the loving hand of a father who is disciplining. Now, I want to take some time and unpack that because when we hear the word discipline, we might think of like being spanked. And the thought of God spanking us is not any more comforting than God being sleepy or vindictive, given the way we've been spanked sometimes. All right? And so, what does it mean that he's disciplining? Well, first of all, the word here is discipline, not punish. And if the author wanted to use the word punish, there's plenty of Greek words he could have chosen, but he chooses the word discipline because in your suffering, there is no wrath, okay? There is no punishment. You have to understand this if you are a gospel person, if you are saved by grace and you accept the the authority of his word, the Bible teaches that Jesus drank that whole cup of wrath on the cross. It's why he was so freaked out at Gethsemane. It's not so much the nails. Yeah, there's physical pain in that, but many people have died that death. What made Jesus' death so unique and so tragic is that for the moment that he was on that cross, he had to drink all the wrath of God that you deserve. And so he says, if there's any way, take this cup from me, God, because I don't want to face all the anger and wrath you have for this evil of this world. And yet he submitted And he drank every last drop. All of God's wrath was poured out on his son. He took it. And so that when he resurrected and broke the power of death and sin, it says in Romans 8, there's now no more condemnation. Zero. There is no more wrath. That's important for me. Because I I love my grandmother. She's almost 90, a woman of incredible faith. But she had this bad habit of teaching some theology that was whack. And and one of it was, like, I would mouth off at her because my grandma raised me for a season, and I turn around and bang my head on the wall by accident, and she goes, see, God's mad at you. (laughs) And I'm like, really? God, that's scary. And to an impressionable child, that makes sense. That's how this world works. But here is the Word of God saying there's no more wrath, zero. So when bad things happen to you, don't ever think, The discipline of God is him spanking you as a knee-jerk reaction out of anger. That is very, very unbiblical. Now, let's look at a couple of reasons why we suffer. If you can look at the board, we suffer because, one, we make wrong decisions and we reap the repercussions naturally. God allows for things to unfold in this uh, space-time reality. So if you sleep around, you might get an STD. That's just a natural outcome of bad decisions. If you have funny money, you'll get bankrupt, which is not so funny anymore, right? If you, um, you know, smoke and, and did not take care of your body, there's things that happen to you physically. So some suffering comes out of the wrong decisions we make. Some come from the wrong decisions other people make. Drunk driving, we're defrauded, we're slandered, so forth and so on. And then suffering sometimes comes, comes by living right 
in a wrong world. This is what the Jews or the Christians were experiencing in that moment where they were trying to live right and the world hated on them and persecuted them and made things difficult. Now, we're in America, so that might not be as obvious, but there are subtle persecutions you face when you try to be a person of integrity at work. Maybe with your family, if you come from a Buddhist background, a Muslim, or, or an atheist background, or Jewish background, and you become a Christian, there might be some hating going on. And so there's, there's suffering that comes by living right in a wrong world, and then there's suffering, and this is the toughest one to swallow, that just comes. Earthquake, hurricane, someone gets cancer, just we don't know why, and, in, and you just live in a broken world, and you suffer because of it. And here's something you have to understand, that in any of these situations, whether it comes by your mistakes or someone else's mistakes or because you're living right or just because this world is broken, none of that is vindictive. None of that is an angry God trying to get back at you. None of it. So what is it? Well, the author calls it discipline. And this word is not spanking. I'm not saying spanking's wrong, but that word is not God physically beating on somebody. It's the word that, that means cultivation. It's the whole span of parenting where you commit your life for the benefit of the child, teaching them, encouraging them, rebuking them, exhorting them, doing all that you can to mold and shape this child so that this child can be his or her fullest potential. That's what it means by discipline. And it says here that if you are loved and you are a child, then you will be disciplined. It's a badge of love. In fact, if you don't get disciplined, then that most likely means you're not loved. Because I know my children, I discipline them a lot because they're mine. I want them to act like me or better, not beneath me, right? Because I'm not the greatest guy, so I want them to go ahead of me. But I'm not going to discipline anyone else's kids. And I see messed up kids around me all the time. Not here at this church, but out in the world. Kids that are just straight up sinful. Okay? But I'm not going to take my time to lecture them or give them timeouts or whatever because I'm busy with my own, you know, fallen kids. So I, because I love my children... I will pour my life into disciplining them with love. Here's the crazy revelation that comes from the Word. What might seem like cosmic neglect or cosmic cruelty is actually your daddy drawing near to you in love. Through pain, he's working in you, shaping you, molding you, pruning you, correcting you, equip equipping you so that you can know more and more of his love. The mind-blowing truth here is that nothing will come to you that is not of love. Nothing. But how is that possible? There's some painful things. How do I receive that? How do I make that true? This is where faith comes in. Okay? In your flesh, this is nonsense. But here's where faith comes in. Faith opens up the door to relationship. It's what allows you to know God as your dad. Without faith, you can't be born again. You can't have the spirit required to know God. Without the Holy Spirit, uh, we're, the Bible says we're dead to God. We cannot know him as he wants to be known. But once we have our faith in Jesus, we're given a spirit that cries what? Abba, Daddy. And so by faith, we're able to have relationship with the God who loves you so much, he's willing to give you Jesus. We, we, by faith, we perceive a God who loves us unconditionally with, an, with agape love. Agape love is a unique love where it gives and expects nothing back. That's the love of God. And this love is amazing. And what you notice in this passage is the author goes out of his way to emphasize relationship. Look at verse 5. It says, uh, addresses you as a father addresses his son. And then, and then that paragraph, my son, do not make light of dot, dot, dot. Verse 6, uh, the Lord disciplines the one he loves chastens everyone uh, he accepts as his son. Verse 7, God is treating you as children. Verse 8, uh, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters. Verse 9, how much more should we submit to the Father? So, so here the author is trying to tie your faith to relationship when it meets suffering. 
You know why that's so important? It's so critical that when we see suffering, we see through the eyes of faith relationship because here's the reason. I take my three-year-old daughter to Target. It's a nightmare, okay? I'm just telling you. <laughs> she asked for so many things. It's ridiculous. From the moment we walk in, I want that, I want this, I want that, and I'm constantly saying, no, 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 not today, maybe tomorrow, no, no, no. I have to be creative with my nose. It gets repetitive. And, and, if, and I'm yanking her because she wants to go that way and this way, and if she, if she runs off, she gets lost. Who knows? Someone could snatch her. There's all these things you think about. And so if she did not know me as dad, I'm this grown-up guy who refuses everything she asks for and is dragging her around. And then, and then after all that, she looks at the pizza and says, I want that. And the candy and the slushy and everything else. No, I'm hungry, dad. Well, we have better food at home. But I want to eat now. And I say no. So now I am this grown-up guy who says no to her, yanking her around, who won't even feed her. Okay? <laughs> and so, from her perspective, if we didn't have relationship, I'm a monster. I'm an absolute monster. Constantly denying her. I'm not going to even feed her in that moment when she's in need. But at the end of the day, she comes running to my lap, the huge smile, kisses on my face. And she knows deep down in her bones, she can't articulate this, she's three years old, but she knows daddy knows best. Daddy loves her. And I might have had complained for things I didn't get right away, but I know in the end my dad is taking care of me and he loves me. Right? Now that's for slushies and pizza and toys. Things get a lot more serious for us. But I haven't even talked about the shots she'll get. You know, and and the homework I'll make her do, and the guys I won't let her date. <laughs> There's much greater no's coming in life. And for us, there are little things that we get denied. There are little things we suffer. There's big things we suffer. But as a three-year-old is to me, the gap between me and my father is even greater. He is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. He's God. And, and yet this God loves me. It says he loves me unconditionally to the point of giving me his son. And here's, here's where faith needs to be applied. When I hurt and when I suffer, I have to remember I'm dealing with dad. I'm dealing with a dad who loves me and who disciplines me because he loves me, because I'm his. And so nothing comes to me that doesn't come through loving hands and a loving heart. And sometimes the best thing we need to do in the midst of pain is to crawl up in our daddy's lap and hear his heartbeat and remember who he is. Every time you suffer, there is a question that's being asked in your soul. Who is God? The careless creator who just kind of wound up the clock and lets it run? A cruel dictator? Or is he as the Holy Spirit has put in me? The loving dad. So that's the first thing to remember, that nothing will touch me that is, not design, or that is not loving. Second, nothing will touch me that is not designed for my good. For my good. The Bible begins to compare earthly parenting with heavenly parenting. And it's, it's the argument of how much more. And so we start with earthly parents. I'm an earthly parent. I've got three girls. I don't discipline well all the time. Does anger creep in? Yes. Am I unfair sometimes? Yes. Do I show favoritism sometimes? They're not here. Yes. <laughs> do I spank too hard sometimes? Yes. Do I just do it out of anger and inconvenience? Um, yes. And yet today I got a Valentine's card from my daughter uh, who says, you're the best daddy in the world. And uh, I don't say thank you enough. Thank you for... Um, loving me and helping me be a better Christian and, and dot, dot, dot. And you know, I was up there kind of tearing up a little bit. Maybe she's using that to get leverage for something. I don't know. <laughs> she's really wily and tricky. But man, she hit the right buns. And so we all can relate to that. Our parents haven't always been the best parents. The Bible says they parented as best they could, and yet we submit to that and we know they're loving, and in general, we receive it well. So the argument is how much more the discipline of a perfect God 
who knows all things and is all-powerful, how much more should we receive that and submit to that? Because there's a purpose in this discipline. It says it's to make us holy like He is, to share in His holiness. That alone is a mind-blowing truth, that our God doesn't want us to make, a, make us just a servile class of slaves in heaven, that He wants us to share in His essence, that we are called to be holy. God didn't have to do that. He didn't have to make us like Him and then eventually make us really like Him through Jesus so that we can share in heaven with Him. He could have had us live 80 years and just perish And that'd be fine. We at least existed, but God wants us to be like Him and be holy. But here's the mind-blowing truth that the way that God has designed for us to look like Him, because that's our calling as children, to look like our dad, is through suffering. Which tells me there are things we can only learn through hardship. That if life was always easy and comfortable and luxurious, it might actually promote the opposite. But when we go through hardship and trial, there are things that God is shifting and doing that only suffering can do to make us like Him, holy. I remember, um, I don't remember, I did this recently. I was watching Gold Rush. Uh, It's a cable show. Um, It's all about these uh, mining crews in Alaska digging for gold. And I think I like it because it's it's like I'm in a house full of women, uh, three daughters, a wonderful wife. And so here's my chance to just be a guy, because you're big trucks, and you're plowing the earth, and there's burly guys, and, and, and the concept's very simple. You dig, and you mine, and in the end, you see how much gold you get. Very simple. No complex emotions, no drama. I mean, there's drama, but it's like male drama, you know? Like, err, kind of drama. What's amazing is how much they have to do violence to the earth to get just a little bit of gold. For a single gold bar, they literally excavate a football field down 20 feet through permafrost into bedrock gravel. Then they churn that through a machine that rinses it, and eventually they sift out the gold flakes, which they then have to melt under high heat to burn away all the impurities. And finally, at the end of that process, you get a little bit of gold. The Bible says your faith is worth more than gold, but it compares it to gold for a reason. One saint said, What is not first melted cannot be minted, right? In other words, because God finds your faith so precious, because by faith it's the only means he can have a relationship with you. He wants to be with you forever, you know that, right? He's gone to great pains to get that done. But because faith is the only channel by what means we experience God, he'll do anything to get at it and grow it. He'll excavate. He'll tear at you. He'll pull things out of you. He'll rinse you. He'll he'll do what seems like great violence to pull out faith, which is worth far more than gold. So it is not an easy process. The author just says that straight up. Discipline doesn't feel good when you're in it. It is painful. But that is the process by which God mines gold. Two points of clarification here before we make some mistakes theologically and start to put God in a weird place. One, let's not confuse Satan's directives with God's discipline. Is that up there? Maybe not. So here's the first clarification. Don't confuse Satan's directives um, with God's discipline because it does us no good to say, Rape is from God, molestation is from God, murder is from God. It's not. That comes from Satan. Now, God can turn that into good. But the Bible is very clear that Jesus came to destroy the works of who? The devil. There are things that are evil that come at us because the devil wants to destroy us. Or it's part of a sinful system in this world inspired by Satan. And so it's so important that we don't call evil things the work of God, okay? Even the Apostle Paul, when he was going through his hardship and prayed for the thorn to be removed, he named it as a messenger of Satan. He's very clear about that. And yet, we can never escape the sovereignty of God. He clearly permits this, right? He clearly allows this, but only... The exact amount that is required 
for the effect that he wants to do in you for good. That's the only reason. Right? Because the Bible says that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. In all things. And so even the things that come from Satan, God will rework for your good. Which is why Paul says, okay, I'm suffering, but this came to me through Satan, and God's using it to teach me what? You guys remember what he taught, what he learned? You learned that my grace is sufficient for you. For your power is made perfect in my weakness. That's a lesson he learned, and that because of that, we all learn through the millenniums. Thank you, Paul, for suffering well. But what we have to remember again, uh, this is a great quote from Tim Keller. God does permit evil, but listen to this. God only allows Satan to accomplish the very opposite of what he wants to accomplish. He only gives Satan enough rope to hang himself. God hates evil. He's against it. He didn't create a world in which evil existed, but he permits it. Why? He permits Satan only to bring evil into Job's life, for example, in such a way, in such an amount that actually completely defeats Satan's real intention. Satan is only allowed by God to actually defeat himself and achieve the... achieve the... very opposite of what he wanted. He permits evil and suffering to come into your life only to the degree that it defeats the actual intention of Satan for you. Only to the degree that it makes you a great person. Only to the degree that it actually defeats itself. The cross is the best example. Because Satan thought he won. But God only allowed that to happen so Jesus can actually defeat Satan on the cross. And end sin. End death. And it says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Be inspired by the cross. What you are suffering comes from Satan. It is evil, but that's not the end of the story. He will turn it for your good, for your holiness. Second thing we need to uh, clarify is that this is not an easy process. It's not an easy process. I don't want to have any glib statements like, oh, this is, you know, God's will and it's fine. No. If we're not designed to suffer, it's hard, it's painful. And there are things that we face. I mean, I just talked to a, a sister who lost her grandfather, and I know it's going to be hard for her for a while. And so you're not designed to just say, oh, God, I'm good, thank you, you love me, I'm good. No. David, the, in the Psalms, is a great example. He was angry towards God. He shouted at God. He questioned God. He demanded answers from God. But all of it was directed to God in faith. And God's got big shoulders. He can handle that. We're not designed just to be, okay, God, I'm suffering, so that's fine. No, we have real emotions, there are real questions, there are real doubts, and we are designed to take that to God and wrestle with Him over time. And God's a big God, He can handle it. And as you wrestle with Him, He stretches out our faith, makes it bigger, makes it more beautiful. So much of the Psalms is David pouring out his agony and finding at the end of it still God loves him. And beautiful things come out of that journey. And so I want you to know that you have permission to doubt, permission to wrestle, permission to be angry and to throw that at God and let God speak back to you because suffering is not easy. We're not designed for it. But let it be directed in faith to God because there are answers and He loves you and He will speak to you. All right? Here's the last thing I want you to know. Nothing will touch me that God will not redeem and use. So the first thing, nothing will touch me that is not coming from love. Second, nothing will touch me that is not designed for my good. And third, nothing will touch me that God will not redeem and use. Look at verse 13. It says, make, Therefore strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Kind of cryptic. Explain what that means, at least what I understand it to mean. He's saying, look, I've given you great reason to run. God loves you. He's got purpose for all this. So run. Pump your arms. Pump your legs and run a straight, clean path. Because you know why? There are people coming behind you that need you to run this way. 
And if you don't run and suffer well, you're going to make them the fault. In other words, our suffering is not just for ourselves. There is a redemptive purpose to it. It says in Psalm 84, a beautiful psalm, it talks about um, pilgrims running after God or seeking after God. It says, blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage as they pass through the valley of Baha, which means tears. They make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. The imagery here is that as you journey towards God, you're going to pass through the valley of tears, a valley of pain, of brokenness, of heartache. But as you suffer well with faith, your tears become springs for others who come behind you to drink from. It's a powerful, powerful image that God does not waste a single tear, not a single one. If you're wondering, what is this all for? Why am I going through this season I'm going through? Well, first, he's doing amazing work in you, growing you, shaping you, making you like him. But secondly, he wants to do an amazing work around people that are near you and can see you. And if you run your race well, it's going to help them. I think of what one theologian wrote about a a middle-aged woman who uh, died of cancer or who was near death, I should say near death, um, has this cancer. And he asked the question, what could God be doing in the midst of this? He says, one, God could be preparing her. God could be preparing her because she's about to go into eternity. And so maybe in this short season, there are things that she has to do by faith to get ready to go home. Or if she suffers well, Maybe God is convicting a son of hers who is aimless and needs to get his head straight and can see his mom running her race well to the end and he gets his life right. Or it could be another son that sees her testimony of faith amidst of this cancer and he's called into ministry because of it. Or it could be the way that she's dealing with her suffering is inspiring a church who also has suffering people. Maybe she died, or or better, maybe she's healed miraculously and that sparks a revival around her, or maybe at her funeral. Her legacy of faith is so powerful that a few people she's been praying for her whole life comes to Jesus. And maybe one of those people becomes a pastor who leads thousands. He says, who knows what God's up to, but he's up to something. And our job is just to fix her eyes on Jesus and to know that nothing will come at us that is not coming from love, that nothing will come at us that doesn't come from purpose, and nothing will touch us that he will not redeem or use. Bow your heads with me.